What's going on everyone? Ali Reza here back with a brand new episode of Iran Tech and I'm back here again at the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran once again checking out the Radio Pharmaceuticals facility to pick up where we left off last time and fill in the blanks when we talked about gallium and lutetium and their diagnostics and uh, uh, therapeutic properties when it comes to cancer treatments and diagnostics of course but we left out one important element in between lutetium and gallium and that was iodine so in this episode we're going to be covering iodine or more specifically the radioactive isotope of iodine and how it fits in perfectly between gallium and lutetium which have diagnostic and uh, therapeutic properties stay tuned <music> The similarity between iodine, uh, lutetium and gallium is that they're all radioactive and they all release emissions, radioactive emissions of beta or gamma rays. But the difference is in what each of them release. Iodine releases both gamma and beta rays, gallium releases only gamma rays and lutetium releases only beta rays and that's how they're different in their functionality. Lutetium is only used for therapeutic purposes because beta rays have therapeutic uh, applications whereas gallium is used only for diagnostic purposes because gamma rays are used for diagnostics. But iodine releases both of these radiations, gamma and beta, so it has both of these properties for diagnostics and for therapeutic purposes. So in microcurie doses in capsule form, we can actually use iodine capsules to uh, diagnose hyperthyroidism or thyroid cancer. And in millicurie doses with the same capsules and in the liquid form, we can actually treat hyperthyroidism and uh, thyroid cancer. But how do we actually get this iodine-131? Because that is the radioactive isotope of iodine that we use. Well, it's no use for me to talk about how we get the natural isotope of iodine, which is iodine-127. So how do we actually get it? Well, we need to take a look at the only element in nature that is radioactive naturally and can be found naturally radioactive. And through the fission of uranium-235, that is one of the methods that we can get uh, 131 iodine. But there's also another method. Let's take a closer look at both of them. The radioactive isotope of iodine used in radio pharmaceuticals is iodine-131 and not the naturally occurring iodine with the atomic mass of 127. There are two ways that we can get iodine-131. One is through the fission of uranium-235, the only naturally occurring radioactive element on Earth. Uranium undergoes neutron bombardment in reactors and through its fission, various element isotopes such as xenon, molybdenum, or iodine is created. And a chemist's job is to extract all these different elements to be used in their own respective field. And if you remember from previous episodes, the molybdenum has its own uses in radiotherapy. Another method of producing active iodine is using tellurium oxide. Tellurium-130 that is within tellurium oxide powder is also bombarded with neutrons until it absorbs a neutron and turns into the metastable tellurium-131, which has one extra neutron. Metastable elements will decay, and after a beta decay and some changes in the nature of the nucleus of the element, tellurium-131 turns into iodine-131 in gaseous form trapped in between tellurium crystals. Now with some heat and melting the crystal will be released and later trapped with a sodium hydroxide solution to then be used in radiopharmacy. Once we have our sodium iodine solution with very high purity, there's a couple steps that we need to take before the drug is ready to be administered to the patient. And that is because the pH level of the sodium iodine solution is really high at 14, we need to bring it down to be able to actually administer it to the patient because that level of pH, you can't take that kind of drug. It will ruin the body as it goes down to the stomach. So that's one thing that we need to do. Another reason is that we need to add some sort of excipient to be able to dispense the solution properly into the vials that we want to get out the door. So the first thing that happens is that we have our uh, sodium iodine solution container that we put inside this first hot cell. 
hot refers to the amount of activity or the radioactivity that happens within these cells. So we introduce the container to the first hot cell uh, as such. And uh, once the container is in, uh, we need to go to the third hot cell where the, the vials are prepared. So the way it happens is that we have, let's say, a 40 Curie uh, solution of um, uh, sodium hydroxide, uh, sodium iodine. And uh, this 40 Curie solution needs to be dispensed between, let's say, 200 different vials, each one of them with, let's say, 20 millicuries. So in order to do that, we need to uh, take, this, take a syringe and gather a little bit, like maybe like one or two cc's uh, of our uh, sodium iodine solution and add it into some vials. Uh, so once we have uh, measured the amount of activity with the Curie meter that measures the amount of radioactivity in any given solution, once we have, let's say, 40 millicuries uh, in our 1 cc or 2 cc solution in the vial, now is the time when we add that active solution to the buffer. The buffer has, uh, is, is called a bicarbonate buffer, which, in, which includes uh, sodium bicarbonate, sodium hydroxide, and uh, sodium uh, thiosulfate. So these are the three things that is in this uh, bicarbonate buffer, sodium bicarbonate buffer. And so now we have, let's say, a solution that is 100 or 200 cc's, and then we take the appropriate amount and dispense it among, uh, let's say, 200 different vials, and the end product is going to look something like this. Very inconspicuous, uh, but that's it. So this is uh, an edible solution. So the, the, the patient will drink it, and uh, the, the iodine within the solution will be absorbed around the thyroid to be able to combat thyroid cancer, uh, like so. And then uh, the other method of application, the other method of administration of this kind of drug is through capsules. So for now, we had the liquid form, but then there's also uh, the capsule form, which is easier to take, um, and also it's a lot more easy to operate and uh, uh, also manufacture because there's less mess, because with liquids, there's always the chance to spill it or, or break a vial or something, but even when this vial breaks, you won't really get much of the, the radioactive substance outside of this capsule. So what happens here is that we actually need a, another solution. We can't use the same solution for uh, the capsule form as we do with the liquid form. So we need a diff different solution with higher density of uh, sodium iodine. And we introduce it the same way that we did with the liquid solution. Uh, but here, with the, with the higher density, what we do is we have uh, these containers for the capsules. Uh, we don't actually open up the capsules. The capsule has a top and a bottom. We don't actually open it up. What we do is we add this particular pallet uh, to the device. We introduce it to the device. And with a very, very tiny needle uh, in the micrometers, uh, we actually inject that solution within these capsules. But within these capsules, we already have a powder. This powder contains disodium hydrogen phosphate. And this is a powder that has a very high absorption property. So you can add, like, let's say, uh, three one hundredths of cc. It has to be very little. The amount is very minuscule. But you add that much liquid into this powder, and the powder absorbs it. and uh, prevents it from uh, being released into the air or going out of the capsule. So the needle is so small that the hole, the piercing that it creates, is so small that liquid can go through it, but powder cannot go out of it. And that, in, in that way, it's going to be uh, sealed properly. Uh, and of course, in the end, what we will get is the same capsule in a vial. And for the, uh, the final step, uh, we, have to, we have to actually think about the packaging, uh, for which, let's take a look here, we have these five kilogram lead containers that you put the vial inside. I'm not going to be able to operate it well with one hand, so I'm not going to uh, attempt to put it in. Maybe I will. OK, that wasn't as bad as, as I thought. And then uh, in this way, uh, the operator or the courier is going to be protected from uh, the radioactivity of this particular uh, capsule and the vials and uh, so forth. So that was it uh, for the last stage of adding the buffer for the liquid solutions and adding the powder to absorb uh, the, the sodium iodine uh, to the capsules. And that's pretty much it as far as the manufacturing process goes. So we have our sodium iodine molecules now. 
either in capsule form or in liquid form, which is taken by the patient, iodine has this natural tendency to be absorbed by the thyroid. Once it is, the radioactivity of iodine-131 will start to damage the cancer cells around it by emitting beta rays, which is used to treat thyroid cancer and hyperthyroidism. Since there is also some gamma rays released, the same process at lower dosages can also be used to diagnose these same diseases. And then after its decay, with a half-life of eight days, iodine will turn into xenon, a noble gas that doesn't react with anything and is safe to pass through the body. This type of therapy can also be used after surgery when the doctor has removed most of the visible cancer tumors, but we want to make sure that if any remains, they will be destroyed through therapy so it will never come back. The iodine-131 MIBG radiopharmaceutical is one of the most important and valuable radiopharmaceuticals to diagnose and treat adrenal glands diseases such as neuroblastoma and pheochromocytoma cancers. This radiopharmaceutical is injectable and produced in a sterile form here. The MIBG radiopharmaceutical includes a benzene ring. In its meta part, there's an inactive iodine, and above the ring, there's a guanidine agent, which is structurally similar to neuroblastoma cells. To mark iodine 131 with MIBG molecule, a very special condition should be created for the reaction to happen. The required environmental conditions for this reaction to happen must be acidic. Temperature condition and the time of reaction are other important points to consider. The inactive iodine in meta part is replaced with radioactive iodine 131 and then it turns into meta iodobenzyl guanidine pharmaceutical. This is mainly used for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes of neuroblastoma cancer. In terms of diagnostic purposes, 1 to 4 millicuries is used for therapeutic purposes, 50 to 200 millicuries is prepared and sent to hospitals. With the help of our own nuclear scientists, we started the project of this precious pharmaceutical in 2019. In the past, we used to import this pharmaceutical and after earning the ability to produce it, we could fortunately stop importing it and supply all our hospitals with this radio pharmaceutical. We also export it to Iraq, Syria and India. We have received very positive feedbacks from our hospitals. This radio pharmaceutical facility started its operation in 2010 at a very low rate of production and now it has actually uh, prevented the import of such radio pharmaceuticals to the country and now we're at a point where we're making enough uh, radio pharmaceutical drugs that we're actually exporting these drugs to Iraq, Syria and India and in order to be able to export these uh, drugs to Europe we need another facility which is about 90 to 95 percent done but this one is actually getting the GMP European standards for sterilization and isolation uh, so that then we not only are able to increase our production but also will be able to export these drugs to Europe as well. Here's hoping that happens sooner rather than later. I hope you've all enjoyed this episode of Iran Tech. I'll see you guys next week.